Mm-hmm. Hello, welcome to part three of Free, an introduction to tribals, battles, and varying class destroyers. My favorite little ships. Although little probably doesn't describe what we're going to be talking about now. And I'm not sure little really describes a tribal or a battle class, but you know, everything's relative. This was the age where there were still battleships. So, you know, maybe. Just maybe. I get to call them little ships. But they certainly are back pocket cruisers. These more than any others. The Daring class come into being, they start off as the 1944 battles, and then they evolve. Peacetime. And the fact that everyone else is focusing on all the other programs going on. Bilge pumps. Yay. It's still going on. So please, turn it on, keep it on, basically. The more people that listen to it, the more it gets shared, the more it gets heard, the longer we'll be able to keep it going. And our plan is to try and keep it going permanently, pretty much. Uh, we have all sorts of plans for it, all sorts of things we'd like to discuss, and it seems to be, thanks to China, there is something new we can talk about almost every other week, every week. And there's so much history we can dive into. It's just the three of us having a chat. And we are going to have guests at some point. So please, suggestions for guests, suggestions for topics, just tweet at us with hashtag bilge pumps. So we know it's about. Comparison. The Daring Class stats. They are 390 feet, or 118.87 meters. So just under 4 meters longer than a tribal. They are roughly 2 meters wider, and roughly 1.5 meters deeper in terms of their draft. And at the place displacing 3,600 tons of water, nearly 1,100 tons more than tribal. They are big. But here's the thing. Remember what I said about the dare, about the battles, that if they'd just been just that little bit bigger, they would have been able to do what their peacetime role was. Their presence mission of a back pocket cruiser. Well, the daring class are just that bit bigger, and by golly, did they do the peacetime role. But also, let's consider them as a cruiser at this point, because they are, keep making the point they're back pocket cruisers, and that's what they evolve into. So, the Arafusa class cruiser is a similar displacement in World War I. But the Daring's have 54,000 ship horsepower, which is more horsepower than the Arafusa class did, and they're able to go 34 knots. Uh, in fact, these ships are so big, they are nearly four times the size of the Acasta class destroyers, which were the current contemporaries of those particular Arafusas. So in roughly 28, nearly 30 years, destroyers haven't increased 100% in size. They haven't increased 200% in size. They have increased 300% in size. So for those of you who are upset that destroyers have just reached 10,000 tons, imagine what the people uh, uh, have sort of reached 10,000 tons in the last few years and are getting bigger and they've got Zumot glass and all this sort of thing. I would point out that that mission growth is nothing compared to what happened in the 1930, between the 1900s and the 1950s. These are launched in 1949. The casters are launched in about hmm, World War One, so about thirty years prior to that. So yeah, some of them were still rolling around in World War One. You know, in thirty years, the ships had quadrupled in size. That is a shock to the system. The ships you're looking at now, you could conv if you'd taken them back to World War I, if you took a daring class destroyer built in 1949 and took it back to World War I, 
she would honestly have taken out most of the German high seas fleet. She not only would have done, she could have done. She's got a full and increasingly massive set of radars. What she's capable of doing isn't uh, what she isn't capable of doing isn't worth doing. She's got ten torpedoes, two quintuple launchers. She's got six very fast firing four point five inch guns. So anything that you know in the nicest way can cause her trouble is going to get blasted at. With her radar, she'll be able to fight them at night. She'd be able to outrun most of their warships. Honestly, that would actually be a way to... Yeah, that'd be a very interesting battle. Battle of Jutland, where Jellico has a flotilla of Derling Kral's destroyers. That'd be an interesting night fight for the Germans. I have a feeling half the German Navy wouldn't be existing after it'd be finished. Now, I'm going to have to look up my notes on this, because I have to be very precise. So... Right then. So, for HMS Daring, Decoy, and Delight, and Diana, the steam came from oil-fired water tube boilers. Um, from Babcock and Wilcox. For Dainty, Defender, Diamond, and Duchess, they came from Foster Wheeler. So, okay, right, so, four ships have one type of boiler manufacturer, manufacturers, and the other four ships have another. This gets further complicated because only four of these ships were fitted with the conventional for the time 220 volt direct current power supply, whilst the other four, Decoy, Diamond, Diana and Duchess, were fitted with the 440 volt free phase alternating current. Meaning that you in effect have four batches within a class of eight, where you have two ships with one type of engine and one uh, type one engines and type one power subsystem. Then two ships which have type one engines and type two power systems. Then two ships which have type two engines and type one power systems. And two ships which have type two engines and type two power. It gets a bit confusing, okay? So why is this the case? Why in ships which were being built to shamelessly be the most powerful ships you could really build in on mass at this time, was the Royal Navy mucking around so? Well, because they could. Because with these were the, uh, the only class they could get, the largest class they could get away with doing this for, because everything else was being watched so much. The cruisers that were being built were being watched by the government like hawks, as were the upgrades on the existing cruisers. Any aircraft carrier stuff they have under construction is being watched obsessively. Anything else they're doing is being watched because of what it is, because of its status. Destroyers, though, oh, these are just destroyers in a move worthy of Admiral Henderson. Oh, these are just the little destroyers. There's no need to worry about these. Yeah, 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 they're just destroyers. They're nothing, nothing. The Royal Navy gets to build what it needs to build. And this is what it builds. Now, in the nicest way, while going through these, I'm going to disappear for a second. So, sorry, but I'm off. You're going to lose the facial reactions for a bit, just so that you can get the full image. So, that is a Daring class, ADM-239-428, taken from the UK National Archives. And that shows you some of the subdivision they have. 
It shows you the layout of these ships, their complexity. And it's pretty cool what they have in them. Um, now, I've already been over the fact that their engines were developed by um, were those sort of specialist types, and that's the reason why they have two funnels. The uh, first, the fore funnel is hidden in the mast, and you can sort of see it poking out if you look very carefully at that picture. And then there's the after one, which is between the two torpedo systems. Uh, these systems were developed by the Parsons and Marine Engineering Turbine Research and Development Association, Palmetto. They're cute. There was a whole debate going on about this time, about whether or not destroyers should be built this large. It was kind of interesting because Admiral Fraser um, sits on them and basically goes, I'm building these destroyers. If you want to have a fight, you can pick a fight with me. And for some reason, no one decides they're going to. Now, I would point out that some of this class, and that is HMS Delight. I, I do not know why the modern Daringers do not have an HMS Delight. It would be so much lovely. Maybe she'd have been number seven. HMS Delight, I could just imagine it. Right. You know, technically, and, and HMS Delight is actually, um, was actually originally HMS Yeeps, but was uh, modified on the stocks if she was ever constructed as Yeeps in the first place. And the Mark VI guns, which feature so prominently, and that's the 4.5 inch mounts you see, the, the three of them, doubles, they could fire shells up to 41,000 feet at an angle of 80 degrees with an elevation of 45 degrees. They could reach nearly 21,000 yards, or 19 kilometers, in excess of the pre-World War II calculated problem maximum effective cruiser fighting range, which was 18 kilometers. So they were definitely well within the levels of cruisers. They had an all-electric galley, fluorescent lighting, but most of all, they have, um, apart from the step-forward structure, which is, gives them look, makes them look pretty cool, they have a, a, the two stag 40mm weapon systems forward, and they have more aft. They are basically festooned with anti-aircraft capabilities, and you've got a squid mortar sitting on the back. They're just festooned and stuff, and we can sit forward. They have so many layers of subdivision within them to try and give you protection, to give the ship protection and to give you uh, the crew protection to make them a survivable asset. These ships are really built around being as survivable as they can be for destroyers. What's interesting is that actually, um, at one point, it does seem to be considered to extend them forward. The uh, for the the extend the hull forward a bit and actually mount the gun the forward guns rather like they have been in a battle class. So even though you've got the gun fine uh, pointing rearwards and you know she got an X turret or X mount. Um, they did consider pushing A and B forward and ex making the hull even longer so that they could cover rearwards as well and as much as X can cover forwards so that you would have a far better all-round firing profile. And also that provides them with a better ability against aircraft if they need it. At one point, there was actually some people who were so obsessed with um, the weight of the ships that some people were putting forward the idea that their deck heights could be reduced to make them lighter, and thankfully, no one listened to them at all. They have an auxiliary close-range blind-fire director, mounted aft. 
and they're just beautiful looking ships, but we're going to get into that in a second. I'm reading through all my notes here and trying not to go into this in so much detail that I bore you to death. Or alternatively, spoil stuff which I'm saving for the live. Right, and now we're back to the lovely pictures. I'm going to start. I'm going to reappear. Not sure what's happened there, but you know. Hello. I missed you. I did. This is HMS Diamond. Um, this is one of the pictures actually from my book. If they've got Maritime Quest next to them, they're ones I bought for my book. And I think I'm allowed to use them for this. I do recommend going to Maritime Quest if you are trying to get pictures for your books or things like that. Maritime Quest are lovely people. They are really, really nice to deal with. And as you can see here, the reason they ended up not having to mount the guns further forward to fire aft is, as you can see, if you look very carefully at the design of the bridge and the superstructure, you'll notice that the angles have been calculated very carefully so that A and B turrets can fire aft. And these are proper turrets, by the way. They are very much proper turrets, and they have the level of protection which they'd have wanted. Now, interesting enough here is the Mark VI is a very, very good system. And its development goes back to prior to World War II. It's the upper deck system. It's not a between deck system like you had fitted on the battle class. And if this system had been managed to be developed in the form it would have been, which wouldn't have been quite as good as this, but had managed to be developed prior to World War II, you would have probably seen pretty much every single destroyer in the Royal Navy outfitted with it because it was or designed to be outfitted with it. And it would have had a major impact on the war because the 4.5 was just that bit easier to maneuver around, which is why they could have the, the whole sort of different angles. And eight, as I said, 80 degrees up to 41,000 feet. There is a big thing made later when the fact they're um, considering fitting sea slug to this. And they actually decide that the re they shouldn't fit sea slug to it because they were going to replace one of the torpedo systems with it. But they decided sea slug was actually less effective than the guns. Well, they don't put that in the piece of paper because no one's going to write that in an official government report. Someone someday might read it. But it... Reading between the lines, and then they decide to get rid of them, which is really sad because, honestly, if you could have had that for the Falklands War, a there would have been a lot of Argentinians crying out for naval uh, that the British have brought an unfair naval gunfire advantage. B, you might have had a far safer time for the British ships in things like San Carlos Water and also various other places deployed because these ships, their radars were actually able to work in short. They'd been designed, the radars had been designed with the channel with Norway experience in mind. So they weren't as orientated around the Cold War, which is interesting enough. It's why eventually they get cut because they aren't as orientated around the Cold War. And I suppose in 1982 they would have been 33 years old. Well, not all of them. Some of them would have been 33 years old. So they would have been a very old, they would have been pretty old ships in some respects, but you know. Not massively old. Um, 
most of them aren't commissioned until 1952, 53, 54. So some of them will be officially less than 30 years old. They start building properly in 1949. It's They could have made a very big difference there, is the point I'm making. And they do look good. You know, you see that. That's gunfire. That's the ability to lay down a lot of heavy metal. That's the subdivision they have on them. You can see the big spaces for the engines, but you can also see the level of work which has gone in to make sure the engines are separated. It goes boiler room, engine room, boil uh, spe gapping space, boiler room, engine room. So it's very unlikely one hit is going to take them all out. Although, again, if you do get a hit in those spaces, you've got a lot of waters that are going to flood in there, so that's going to cause fun. But that's why you have the level of subsidization you do have fore and aft to try and prevent the, you losing buoyancy if that happens. And also, let's be honest, there's a less experience of HMS Eskimo. They do know that these destro fighting destroyers do like to lose their bowels. Most other ships consider their bowels essential items. These don't. It's just so disturbing. What's interesting is this class is probably the last class of destroyers to be designed around torpedoes. The tribal class were, of course, this big thing because they had to make them able to fit on the treaty limits uh, to be cruiser destroyers, to be able to do the roles they needed to be do. They had to lose one of their torpedo launchers, so... Mm -hmm. Daring class, which are in many ways the last of this strand of back pocket cruisers. Although, again, you could argue the county class continue it on, because they're de facto cruisers, and Type 42 is definitely not, sorry. No. Type 45s? Mmm... Trouble is, they're such area air defense destroyers that as, as impressive as they are, and they're so important, yeah, would you call them cruisers? That's the thing. Could they be used as present ships? You see, the thing is, you're doing it the, the daring class of 1949. And let's get to a slightly better picture. Yeah. The Daring class of 1949 are about as much as a present ship as you can possibly build. The Royal Navy is dealing with a very real scenario where it's got a lot less cruisers than it used to have. It's got a lot tighter budget than it used to have. It's had a tight budget for a while, but it's never been quite this tight. And what are they going to do? How are they going to make it work? Well, they're going to make it work by returning to the back pocket cruiser idea, to returning to this cruiser as a, this destroyer as a cruiser substitute. And these are cruiser substitutes, but let's be honest, they look pretty like cruisers if you're looking and thinking about them. And what they can do. is I can double your images very easily. There you go. There is HMS Daring. So now you've got two views of these ships. You can see their lines, you can see the presence of them, you can see they are they're beamy ships for their time. They are beautiful ships, but they have a presence. And I don't want to sound negative about the battle class because the battle class are very good ships, but they are built during World War II, and you can tell that with the way their festooned weapons, where the way their weapons are structured. 
in many ways the Darien class are just as well armed, if not better armed, than the Battle class. Overall, you may have six 4.5 inch guns for starters, and the Battle class just have five. Um, and instead of the gun being mounted somewhere in the middle of the ship, and sort of having to fire around everything, they've got the X turret. But... The more thing about this is the design. It's the presence it brings. It's the statesman's like like nature of it. It's the fact that it's got space. You know those torpedo areas. If you look at the way the hull is nice and wide, sort of around them, the torpedoes will still fire quite easily. But that space you can use for entertaining. That's diplomatic space. It's got a good galley on it for for feeding people. You've got a lot of space to move around the ship to host a decent event. And that's important because a present ship is as much about having the weaponry as it is about being able to showcase the weaponry in a way which is walk softly, carry a big stick. Okay, I can't think of anything better to say than that one. Couldn't remember if I'd added another destroy. There was another picture I considered adding, but I think I decided to save it for the live. <sighs> These are very, very good looking ships. These are ships which you would want at sea. And the whole point about them, the whole thesis in a way I'm arguing, a hypothesis I'm arguing in my book, and I'll admit this, is that the Royal Navy was needing to have a vessel which would have the impact and presence of a cruiser, and specifically of a county or town class cruiser, but wouldn't cost anywhere near as much. The tribal class, I would argue, get there, but they get there in a bit of a way by the skin of their teeth, and it's on interwar standards. Where you have to you have to play limited, and technically they still do play fast and loose with those standards. But the battles, well, the battles. I love dearly. I do. I love them very much. But. And I say this with all feeling. No. They have statements, they have presence, but they are too much of a pure power warship to be what they need to be in terms of presence for peacetime, which is why they are gone so quickly in so many ways. Although they do have a very interesting second life as being radar pickets and all sorts of things being considered for them. The tribals, well, there's HMS Ashanti's Exderba, which I'll be talking about in the live, and other things which show their facilities for doing naval diplomacy, but there are so many get lost during World War II, and the ones that survive have been so overworked by the end of World War II that, frankly, Britain's just absolutely S-H-I-T-T-Y to them and gets rid of them in minutes of virtually after World War II is over. 48, 49, they're gone. Some earlier than that. It's just... Yeah, it, it, it doesn't sit well with me the way they get rid of them. I think if any class... I would quite happily have made the case and for HMS War Sprite to be maintained, and I think if any other class deserved to be maintained, oh, it's the Tribals and probably HMS Nubian, because she's only just beaten by War Sprite. 
and that's because destroyers get campaign awards and battleships get a it's automatically a battle award when a battleship turns up it seems if you consider the number of firefights Nubian was in that were big vicious firefights for the time she probably yeah, should have out battle on a dwarf spite but she didn't so we'll leave that to one side but the thing is and I know I'm moving across so I hope I don't make you too sick but I'm moving across for a reason. Sorry, I'm blocking the battle. These two classes are the epitome of this. The battles are wartime experience, and that's what happens to them. But in many ways, when I look at the darings of 1949, I'm looking at the evolution I would expect to see if Henderson's L-Class had been built and they'd been successful at peacetime and he'd been alive, he'd have probably gone off. And in my mind, if he comes back as first Sea Lord eventually, about four or five years later probably, this is what he would have built. This is what would have been built. A daring class destroyer would have been the successor to the ships he'd already had being built. If not, he'd gone. If not, it'd have been straight off the class, off the L class. M's or N's would have looked like it. And they are excellent destroyers. They really are. They have the torpedoes, which are the weapons of the time. So, okay. In the current missile-dominated age, you it, it's hard to make the case so much for the torpedo. But in World War Two, in World War One, in the interwar period, up until probably about the 19, early 1960s, these torpedoes mattered. And in many ways, the Daring class are a response to Russian cruisers, to the Svoldov class, the starters, and Russian naval diplomacy that's going around the world at the time. Britain needs to have a presence again. Britain needs to build up its presence again. It needs to have more ships out there. And this is what they're for. This is why my dream fleet, I make the case for as many Type 31s as I do, because I see the Type 31s as the presence ship. The ships you can afford to have going around the world because they have enough status, enough presence that they will have presence, that you will be able to have a diplomatic impact with them. But they aren't so big. They aren't so critical that if you lose one, you have lost a major thing. In the case of the Darings... The reason that wasn't possible was because you had so many of them. You had eight. So this is the thing. If you lose one, you've still got seven others. So you haven't lost a major part of your force. They're your general purpose assets. So yes, it's annoying to lose one. You'd prefer not to. You'd always prefer not to lose one. But... Sometimes it happens. That's the nature of war. That's the nature of global conflict. But these ships were going to have an impact wherever they turned up. And they did turn up. They... Oh, let me see. Let me just get chapter 6 out. And 
sorry, disappearing behind a piece of paper. I forgot it was on the last page. Um, rather pertinent for today, and today's news coming from Hong Kong. On the 1st of October, the Defender was visiting Yokosuka, the USN joint base in Japan, in preparation for a planned joint exercise. It never happened. Instead of a run ashore, the crew never even made it to the Liberty boat. Communist Chinese forces were thought to be massing to invade Taiwan across the Formosa Strait. The Defender was dispatched immediately, conducting a five-day patrol which would end in Hong Kong from this point onward, uh, end in Hong Kong. From this point onwards, until the third week of January 1954, she would keep up a constant series of patrols on the straits. Acting as a very visible and potent British sentinel, as well as tangible signal of British interest in events. It was only after the government was sure no threat would materialise, the defender was sent to Sazebo to join with one of Birmingham's sisters, HMS Newcastle, for a final patrol of Korea's west coast. Interesting enough, it was Birmingham and Newcastle which the defender was sent out to cover instead of crew and uh, the crew uh, to the cover instead of cruisers whilst they were in refit hms defender one of these was sent out to cover instead of crew town class cruisers right i'm well over my 35 minutes <laughs> i hope you will still watch this all the way to the end this is, of course, Back Pocket Cruisers Part 3 introduction. And if I'm right and you're watching this about 2 o'clock in the afternoon because I managed to get everything loaded up properly, then I'll see you for the live in about 4 hours' time where you'll get a lot more pictures. There might even be pictures of Town Class Cruisers in it. <laughs> AC Naval History on Twitter. Uh, Naval History Live on Patreon, my book fund. I'm going to make a plug for it because, frankly, my books are, well, critical to my research amount. They are. <laughs> and I love doing brew ships. And for that, getting more books in them really does help. Global Maritime History. It's a good site. Thank you. That has been Tribals, Battles, Darings, The Back Pocket Cruisers, and Introduction. And that's been Darings. Thank you. And I think, and thank you to all my subscribers. Thank you to everyone who likes and shares. Thank you to all my Discord members. Thank you to all my patrons. Thank you to everyone who's pre ordered my book. Thank you very much to everyone. As I said, I'm not going to cover the full book in these talks and on the live, but I'm hoping to give you a taster enough to make you interested in the book. Thank you. Take care. I know, it's shameless. I want to make you interested in the book, but that's because I've done all this research. I want people to actually read it. I don't think you get paid much as an academic for your books. I, I don't think it's going to make me rich. But if I've done, I spent the last four years researching this, um, right, and a year last year writing it. I want people to bloom and read it. Sorry, Randover. Thank you. Take care.